والله يدعو إلى دار السلام ويهدي من يشاء إلى صراط مستقيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to Inspirations All praises due to Allah We praise Him We seek His aid And we ask for His forgiveness We seek refuge in Allah From the evils of ourselves And the evils of our actions Whomsoever Allah guides None can lead astray And whomsoever Allah leaves to go astray None can guide I bear witness that none has the right to be worshipped But Allah alone Who has no partners And I bear witness that Muhammad Is His servant and His messenger Welcome to a new episode of Inspirations. We're still talking about the wonderful life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the messenger of Allah, the mercy to mankind, the gift that Allah has given humanity to show them the light and take them out of the darkness, to show them the way that leads to paradise. We came to the point where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, along with his companions, constructed al-Masjid al-Nabawi, the Masjid of al-Madina, the Masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It was one of the most important events in the period after Hijra. Because the masjid is, plays such a central and important role in the Muslim society or a Muslim community. No matter where the Muslims live, be it in a Muslim country, in a non-Muslim country, the masjid plays such a wonderful role. And I say today, especially in the Western countries, especially in the non-Muslim countries, the masjid plays such an important role in the life of every Muslim individual and in the life of the Muslim community. Those Muslims who don't get themselves linked to the Muslim community in the masjid, most of those people find it extremely hard to practice their religion. Actually, most of those don't even practice Islam. And the Prophet ﷺ told us that the wolf eats from the sheep that is apart from the rest of the, of the herd, that is away from the herd, because it's weak by itself. The Muslims need to get together so they will encourage one another, they will strengthen one another, and they will teach one another and support one another. And at least one f needs to feel that he's part of this community so that he can preserve or she can preserve his or her identity. It is such an important thing. Now in the life of Muhammad wasallam, as they migrated to Medina, the Prophet wasallam used to pray whenever the time for the prayer came, he would just pray wherever he was, in a house, in his house, in the house of one of his friends, one of his companions, or in any part of Al-Madina, he would pray in any place he would be in. But the Prophet ﷺ received the command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to establish the masjid and to build it. And we said that the Muslims built it was such a wonderful moment, such a wonderful time when they all took part in the building of the masjid, showing the solidarity, showing the beautiful spirit that the Muslims had at that time, being brothers, being equal, enjoying the freedom that Allah has granted them. After fleeing from Mecca, now they have enjoyed this, this freedom and this liberty to practice their religion and to establish the masjid that will be the center, that will be the basis and the foundation for the spread of Islam from this moment on. So they built this beautiful masjid and we talked about some of the beautiful stories how the Prophet ﷺ used to build the masjid along with the other Muslims. He would hold the bricks, carry them from one place to, to, to the other, help the builders place the bricks on their appropriate place. So the Prophet ﷺ was just like any other individual among his companions. And they all took part in that. And we talked about the, uh, the companion who came from Al-Yamama was such a skillful builder. A person who could really, had very good skills in terms of building. So the Prophet ﷺ gave him advantage and he said, make use of his skills. And this shows us that the Prophet ﷺ appreciated skills, appreciated specialty, appreciated the gifts and the merits that his companions had. Now the masjid was ready and they decided to build for the Prophet ﷺ a house because he used to live in the house of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, this generous man, this man with such great sen sensitivity in, te in terms of hospitality, in terms of generosity, in terms of his, uh, in terms of the respect he showed the Prophet ﷺ. Now they built for the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam a few chambers, small rooms, just to be his house. Because his wife Sauda was on the way from Mecca to Medina along with a caravan. And 
Uh, also, there was the his second wife Aisha. She was on the way, coming to Al uh, Al Medina, and we talked about her sister Asma when she was when she gave birth to her son Abdullah ibn Zubair ibn Awam, the first Muslim or the first newborn in the religion in Islam in the uh, time Al Islam was there. So the Prophet وسلم, moved into his new house. And when he used to give khutbah to the people, and they made for him, there was a trunk of a tree, a huge trunk of a tree. Some say it was a trunk of a palm tree. The Prophet ﷺ used to depend on it when he gave khutbah. He used to stand next to it, depend on it, and give the khutbah to the people. The people came from all around them in Medina. Some of the villages outside Medina, they used to come for the Jumu'ah to uh, listen to the khutbah of the Prophet ﷺ and pray with him. And there were different masajid around Al Medina, around the outskirts of Medina or the villages around Al Medina. But Al Masjid al Nabawi was the jama', was the main masjid where the people used to gather for the Jumu'ah to listen to the khutbah of the Prophet ﷺ and pray with him. So he used to pray depending on that trunk. And one day, as the Muslims start, the number of the Muslims started to grow. More people started to come to Islam. People from different tribes of Arabia, people from Medina, the inhabitants of Medina, they started to come and flood into Islam. So the number of Muslims you know, was on the rise, day in, day out. Now the masjid was full, most of the time was full, especially during the Jumu'ah, was full with the people. So somebody came with... Uh, a suggestion to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said to him, the numbers are increasing and you need to stand on some kind of a podium, some, some, some kind of a higher, some steps you can stand on so the people could see you and your voice could get you know, to more people. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam agreed to the suggestion. Some say that it was the suggestion of a woman from the Ansar. She said, oh Messenger of Allah, you know, my, I have a slave. And this man is skilled, is very skillful. He's a carp, he was a, carp, a carpenter. So let him make a podium for you or a minbar, a pulpit for you to stand on. A few steps, you can stand on them and then you can de deliver your khutbah and more people would be able to see you, benefit from you and listen to your khutbah. The Prophet ﷺ agreed to that. So the carpenter went to some of, there were some, you know, some woods around. So he cut some trees, he brought them and he made the minbar or the pulpit for the Prophet ﷺ. It was made of three steps. Two steps, the Prophet ﷺ would mount those two steps and he would sit on the third, on the top one. And then he would give the khutbah. So the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, that the minbar should consist of three steps, not more than that, especially like some of the traditional masjids that we have, they have a very high pulpit, a very high podium with about at least 10 steps with, a, with long stairs. We don't need that. And the problem with this kind of member is that it cuts the rows, especially the first and the second rows. And some masjids, there are five rows cut by those stairs or the steps that lead to the top of the member. And this is totally against the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ because the line has to be connected. The line in the masjid has to be connected. This is one of the most important etiquettes in the prayer that the Muslims today have done away with. Many people don't know about that. They pray between the, so between the poles or between the, uh, the pillars and the line is split. This shouldn't be the case. The, the line should be connected. The rows should be connected. This is an etiquette that we have to pay attention to today. We have to teach it to the people that we know in our local masjid. So the Prophet's pulpit was made of three steps. He would mount two steps and he would sit on the third. And then he would stand and he would give the khutbah. Now there was such a beautiful event, such a beautiful thing that happened during that time which really reveals that Muhammad is the most, is the dearest Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala among his creation. The Prophet ﷺ, the first time he gave khutbah on his pulpit or on the podium, he started giving the khutbah. Once he started, such a new voice was in the masjid, a strange voice. And I could imagine the companions when they heard this, this voice or this sound, they didn't know wh where it came from. 
It was like a little baby screaming and yearning as if this little baby was wanting something, was, was yearning for his mother. I could imagine the companions were looking around, you know, trying to find out the source of this noise, the source of this voice. Where was it coming from? It was the trunk that the Prophet ﷺ used to lean on when he gave the khutbah. It started to scream like a child. The Prophet ﷺ recognized that where the voice was coming from. So he went down and he hugged the trunk of the tree as if he was calming it down. And it made the same noise as a little child, you know, having been screaming for a long time, then his mother would came to calm him down. This was exactly the noise or the sound coming out from that trunk. The people, now the, the, the companion that narrates this event says, the whole masjid was in tears when they saw that. Imagine a trunk of a tree, a piece of wood, was yearning for the Prophet ﷺ. It missed the Prophet ﷺ. He used to lean on it. So the Messenger ﷺ said, you know what it was, why it was screaming like that? was screaming because it started missing the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This was a piece of wood, a trunk of a tree. Maybe it has a heart which is softer than many of our, the hearts of many among us. A piece of wood would miss the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the name of Allah, the verses of the Qur'an being mentioned next to it, near it. It would listen to that. And it was missing the Prophet ﷺ. Just a piece of wood. But this piece of wood had servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was so pure from inside. So the companions were old in tears when they saw that. When they recognized just a piece of wood had such a sensitivity that many among us don't have. Recognition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of his words, of his names, of all of that. Many among us like that. That was only a piece of wood. And this reminds us of the stone that used to give salam to the Prophet وسلم, greet the Messenger وسلم, when he was in Mecca. Actually in Islam, and we know in the Quran that Allah says, وَإِن مِّن شَيْءٍ إِلَّا يُسَبِّحُ بِحَمْدِهِ وَلَكِ لَا تَفْقَهُونَ تَسْبِيحَهُمْ That everything in this world glorifies Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, makes tasbih of Allah, glory, in, actually it celebrates the praises of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but you, you are unable to recognize, you are unable to detect, you can't tell the glorification, you can't tell that, but they do feel the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they do praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they worship Allah, but we can't tell, we can't detect this praise. But many humans, are totally heedless of their Creator. The Prophet ﷺ one day was walking with some of his companions and he saw the mountain which was called Uhud, Mount Uhud, where the Battle of Uhud happened. When he saw that, he said, Uhudun Jabalun nuhibbuna wa yuhib, uh, nuhib, nuhibbuhu wa yuhibbuna. The mountain of Uhud, Mount Uhud, is a mountain that loves us and we love it. A mountain loves the Prophet ﷺ, it loves the Muslims, it loves Islam, yes it does. And we love it. The Prophet ﷺ loves the mountain of Uhud. Even one day the Prophet ﷺ was with Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman. He was with them on, the mount, on Mount Uhud. And the mount shook. Out of respect for the Prophet ﷺ, out of awe that many people don't have out of fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet sallallahu said to him, be calm, calm down, be steady. Because standing on you is a prophet. A Siddiq, a truthful and righteous person, the most truthful among humans, and a martyr, Umar ibn Khattab. So the stones, the rocks, the trees, the pieces of wood that we see around the skies, the heavens, the earth, everything in this world recognizes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and worships Him. But unfortunately, some humans who have been given the ability, who have been given reason, who have been given intellect, they don't recognize the Creator and they don't worship Him. Such a pitiful situation for many people. 
So this was something happened. Even this piece of wood recognized that the Prophet ﷺ was no longer going to give khutbah, leaning on it. So it felt bad about itself. And it started screaming, a piece of wood. Some people might say, well, this is fictitious to us as this event was handed down to us, came down to us through the generations, through authentic ch chains of narration. We believe in it and we have no doubt about it. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator of everything, He can give everything the ability that He wants to give. He can give, he can give the ability for a piece of wood to speak or to scream or to express itself. This is within the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We know that Allah is powerful over everything. He can do everything He wants. So we believe in that without any doubt. Now this pulpit or this podium of the Prophet sallallahu the Messenger sallallahu said about it, that the four pillars, or the four, yes, the four pillars of my pulpit, of my podium, are pillars in paradise. They are part of paradise, part of Jannah, which every Muslim should do his best to get there. And we know the hadith where the Prophet ﷺ said that between my minbar, between my pulpit and my house, there is a garden, one of the gardens of paradise. Such a beautiful atmosphere was prevailing over Medina, where Islam was spreading, Muhammad was becoming their leader, is Islam was seen in every aspect of their lives, the Muslims started to practice these such high level and lofty example of brotherhood that was present among the Muslims was such a beautiful atmosphere that every, every Muslim would be willing to live in. That was the atmosphere, that was the air in which the Muslims were living at that time. Living with the Prophet ﷺ, having the freedom to practice their religion, to learn it and to spread it and to call the people to Islam. Such a wonderful atmosphere that every one of us really wishes the, he, we had the, cha the chance to be with those people. But we say Allah chose for us to live at this time. And we say all praise is due to Allah. He knows about us more than we know about ourselves. So we thank Him for everything He's given us. We thank Him for guiding us to Islam and we should be appreciative. We should be thankful. We should be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now it was time for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to marry Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her. Such an important event that many people shed so much doubt, so many misconceptions on that. And this is such an important thing that in the future, inshallah, we will deal with. Now, inshallah, join us after, to, after the break to talk about more events, beautiful events in the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa See you, inshallah, after the short break. Is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. It is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Inspirations. Just before we talk about the marriage of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her. As we were talking about building al-Masjid al-Nabawi, the Masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it's worth mentioning here that there are only three masajid, only three mosques in the world that a person is allowed to set out, to travel, to go and pray in one of them. Now any person who sets out to travel deliberately with the intention of praying in a certain masjid, believing that there is a merit for that masjid, other than those three, then this person is making an innovation and a grave sin in Islam. Now those three masjids are Al-Masjid Al-Haram in Mecca and 
the Masjid of the Prophet وسلم, and the Masjid Al-Aqsa in Palestine, in Al-Quds, in Jerusalem. These are the only three masjids. And Allah has favored them over all other masjid of the world. So it's not permissible for any person to go to a masjid specifically believing that this masjid has some kind of merit, some kind of excellence, some kind of a special reward. He goes and prays in that masjid deliberately. Now this is a grave sin and this is an innovation. This is a bid'ah in Islam. So don't do that. Some people travel to masjids where there are graves. Believing that those masjids have a merit because there was a righteous person, you know, buried in that masjid, or there was a prophet. Some people believe there was a prophet in that uh, buried in that masjid or in that area. We say this is totally against Islam and against the general lines, the general the general teachings of an Islam. This is totally, as I said, goes against Islam and its teachings because it it tarnishes the purity of Tawheed, of the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is why it's very important to point to this issue, especially that many people among the, uh, the people with poor education among the Muslims, they don't see any problem traveling to a certain masjid, believing it has a, some kind of a merit, some kind of an excellence, because a righteous person prayed someday there. No. We're not allowed to make a journey or to travel, to pray in a certain masjid, specific masjid, believing it has such an excellence. And this actually applies even to the masajid in Mecca and Medina, where some people say this is, these are the seven mosques. It's from the sunnah to go and visit them. No, there's, it, this kind of visit has no basis in the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam. Now the messenger wasallam, was time for him to marry Aisha. Aisha was nine years old. He already married her, but it was time to consummate the marriage. She was nine years old. Now many people cast so many doubts and misconceptions about that. Just to be honest, I've been making a research on this. I've been trying to collect different views, different accusations, different some kind of uh, refutations you know, to Muslim scholars about this and about the misconceptions. Uh, you know, that were cast by some of the Orientalists. And there was something I noticed that was very clear, that those misconceptions and those doubts about th this marriage only came through Orientalists. And for about 100 or 1,200 years, nobody spoke about this, especially the enemies of the Prophet ﷺ at that time. None of them criticized Muhammad ﷺ for this kind of marriage. Actually, this kind of marriage was, was something normal. Was something normal. There was no objection to that. So why did this kind of, these kind of misconceptions coming at this day and age? Because now, this, this is where the answer to these misconceptions actually lies. Because those misconceptions emanate from the fact that there is a dominant culture today, which is the Western culture. Now, the, the West has managed to impose its culture in the world through the media, through the books, through education, through different channels, they managed to make their culture the reference point. If you remember, we talked about the reference point maybe a year ago when we started this series on the life of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. A reference point, we said, if you the those who managed to create the reference point and make their their culture the reference point, these those are the winners, because the reference point becomes considered by many people the default culture. And if you break from it, then you are making a mistake. Then you have to defend yourself and you have to substantiate your stance. So we say for 1200 years, no one, you know, spoke or no one brought this point to attention that this kind of marriage doesn't make sense. But when the West managed to impose its culture, they managed to make this a point of criticism. Now this is, as I said, I will not deal at this moment with, the, with, the, with those accusations. When time is appropriate, inshallah, we will bring this, po this point to light. We'll bring the accusations to light. When we have developed a clearer idea 
of what kind of person Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was. So when I see the right point, inshallah, we will talk about this. But as as, as I said, the key to answering the, to the misconceptions of the Orientalists about this marriage is that they come from a Western point of view and they want to judge the whole world based on that. And there is some kind of assumption that their culture and their outlook on life is the judge over others. Now this is something we have to deal with inshallah at a later stage. So the Muhajireen are living along with the Ansar in Medina just, just like one family, like the members of one family. No discrimination, no prejudice. All were considered to be equal. And actually the Muhajireen, because they saw such a wonderful generosity on the part of the Ansar, their hearts were inclined to the Ansar. They loved them so much. They were amazed at such a level of, at such a high level of generosity, of hospitality, of sacrifice. So they wanted to become closer to them. So many among the Muhajireen started to marry women from Al Ansar. One of them was Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib, the uncle of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When he saw how wonderful those people were, the people of Medina, how generous they were, how good hearted they were, he decided to marry one of them. So he married a woman called Khawla, Khawla bin Tuqais ibn Fahd, one of the people of Al Medina, one of Al Ansar. And you know when you have a good relationship with a person and then you start, you marry one of his relatives, now this bond becomes stronger. And this is what the Muhajireen wanted. They wanted to get closer to Al-Ansar because they saw that they, these were such a good people that we've never seen anyone who could rise up to such an example, such a great example of generosity, of love and sacrifice. So Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib married Khawla. Khawla bin Tuqais ibn Fahd from Al Ansar, and it was such a happy family. He, they built such a happy family, um, and even the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he used to visit Hamza in his house, and even his wife Khawla she used to narrate some of the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam because he used to come to the house of Hamza and she used to listen some of the hadith of the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This is how their women were. They were so keen in knowledge, on knowledge. They wanted to learn. They were always keen to learn from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. If they heard any word, they would preserve it and they would record it and they would spread it. So there were so many women among the companions who narrated hadiths from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Now Khawla for example narrates to us a hadith where the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam visited his uncle Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib and he sat with them and he, he sat with him and he spent some time and she asked him, O oh, Messenger of Allah, uh, we heard that you mentioned that you will have a pond which is Al-Kawthar a pond of water where the believers will drink from on the day of judgment. He said, yes. And he said, you know, who are the people that are most keen that they drink from that pond? She said, who? He said, your people, Ansar, the people of Medina, because of the love the Prophet ﷺ had for them in his heart, because of their sacrifice for the sake of Islam, that they opened their city, they opened their hearts, they opened their houses for the people of Mecca. Come, for the believers from Mecca, come to our houses. We will share everything with, with you. We'll split ev we will split everything in half. We'll take half and you will take the other half. Such a wonderful generosity. So the Prophet ﷺ had so much love for them. So he said to them, the Prophet ﷺ said to her, yes, and the people that I love to drink from it, that, are, that, are, that I care most about to drink from this pond is your people, is the, are the people of Al-Ansar. And one day she narrates that the Prophet ﷺ, that she gave him some food, she offered him some food, which was some kind of a soup. When the Prophet ﷺ touched it with his hand, it burnt him. So the Prophet ﷺ made a word. This word, you know, was said by the Arabs when every time they were burnt, they felt some, something hot or something cold. He said, hiss. So he said, subhanAllah, Bani Adam is so weak. The son of Adam is so weak that when he is hurt by fire or by something hot, he says, hiss. When he's hurt by something cold, he says, hiss. This is human being. Then he said that this life is beautiful. This life is, has greenery and is attractive. Anyone who takes its pleasures, 
with moderation and his heart is not preoccupied with chasing those uh, uh, those pleasures of this life and he takes it without violating the rules of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the teachings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it will be good for him but anyone who, whose heart becomes preoccupied with this life whose heart starts to chase the pleasures of this life then this, this person will lose the hereafter which is the real life so this is how, this gives us a glimpse on what kind of life the people were living in Medina, the, the Muhajireen and the Ansar. One day the Prophet wasallam heard some bad news about As'ad ibn Zurara, one of the Ansar, one of the early believers in al Medina. If you remember when we talked about Bay'atul Aqaba al-Ula and the Thaniya, the first covenant of Al-Aqaba, and the second one, when the people from Medina came and they gave their word to the Prophet ﷺ in Mecca during the Hajj season, As'ad ibn Zurara was one of them. He was one of their leaders. The Prophet ﷺ heard that he was very ill and he was about to die. The Prophet ﷺ felt really sad about that. And he went to the house of As'ad ibn Zurara. And he tried to provide him with some kind of medicine, but... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, oh the, the time for As'ad ibn Zurara was due for him to leave this world. Such a man who sacrificed a lot. And actually he was the one who had Mus'ab ibn Umair in his house before the Hijrah. When the Prophet sallallahu had sent Mus'ab ibn Umair to spread Islam in Medina, to teach the Muslims there, teach them the prayer, teach them Tawheed, teach them the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa As'ad ibn Zurara had him in his house as his guest. And he was providing him with, with protection. So such a wonderful man in the history of Islam, he was dying. And that was exactly what happened. He passed away. And the Prophet ﷺ felt very sad, very sad about losing such a wonderful man. Such one of the heroes of Islam, As'ad ibn Zurara. He died. So the Prophet ﷺ commanded that he be washed and then they prayed on him the janazah prayer and then he, they took him to al-baqiya where the prophet وسلم, decided to place him in his grave and the messenger وسلم, was sitting next to his grave feeling sad about losing such a wonderful brother like as'ad ibn zurara and when the messenger وسلم, was sitting next to his grave and asking forgiveness for him there was a stranger. This stranger had come to the Prophet ﷺ when he was in Quba. And if you still remember, he gave the Prophet ﷺ some food and he said, This is charity. This is some food that I kept for charity. So I, I, I heard that you need it and your companions need it. So take it and share it with your friends and with your companions. So the Prophet ﷺ gave it to his companions, but he didn't, de he didn't eat from it. Now, who was this person? Join us after the break to find out, inshallah. So we'll have the short break. Stay tuned. It is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong. And if you look into the early tafsir, early exegesis of the Quran, you will find that uh, all the Mufassirin were trying to find out where are these seven earths. Earthquakes, natural or artificial, can delineate the boundaries between seven different zones within the earth. And the conclusion that we have seven different layers within the earth came to not only in the 20th century. The true believer would prostrate down in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the blessings of that prostration will reach the seventh earth. It is just Allah's way to make our spirits Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back. You're still watching Inspirations. Just before we carry on, I'll remind you to write to us on our email address inspirations at huda.tv again it's inspirations at huda.tv and as I said your emails really add a lot to the show 
Some of your suggestions are very good and we have benefited from them and we've tried to implement them, even your phone calls. So you can f call us inshallah when we have an, a live episode. So please keep in touch with us because we really benefit from the comments that you send us and we try to implement some of your suggestions. So may Allah reward you for that. So the Prophet وسلم, along with his compa companions, after losing such a wonderful man as As'ad ibn Zurara, and after burying him, the Prophet وسلم, was sitting next to his grave, seeking forgiveness for him. He noticed there was the same stranger who one day had come to him and gave him some charity. And he said to him, I've saved this food for charity. And I heard that you and your companions need some food. So the Prophet Sallallahu didn't eat from it, but he made his companions eat from it. Nick, he said, this is the first one. This is, the stranger said, this is the first one. Next time he came, and he came, gave the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi some food, and he said, this is a gift, not a charity, this is a gift. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi ate from it, and he gave his companions, and they had some of it. When this stranger saw that, he said, well, this is number two. This is the second one. Now this time the same stranger was there. It seems that it was the same funeral or janaza prayer of As'ad ibn Zurara. So this man was there, the stranger was there. And he was watching this, this scene. He was doing something really strange. He looked, he was trying to go behind the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he was as if he was trying to see something on the back or on the neck of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was searching for something. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam realized that. He noticed that this person was searching for something because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was sitting and he had two cloaks. He had them on his shoulder and actually they started to fall. They were, started, they were hanging on the shoulders of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this stranger was going deliberately behind the Prophet Sallallahu and he was looking at his back as if he was searching for something. The Prophet Sallallahu noticed that. So he let his garments fall off his shoulders. He realized that this man was searching for the sign of prophethood because the Prophet Sallallahu had some kind of a sign. Few hairs on his back, on the skin of his back, the, the, which made a certain shape which was called the sign of prophethood and it was written in the books of the Jews and the Christians in the in the scriptures it was there a sign to recognize the Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and this was exactly what this stranger was what was searching was looking for the prophet sallallahu alaihi realized that so he let his garments fall off his shoulders and with when this stranger saw the sign straight he hugged the Prophet ﷺ, he started kissing him and he started crying and weeping in such an emotional way that the companions were taken by that. The Prophet ﷺ said to him, come here, come here. He came and he sat before the Prophet ﷺ and the Messenger ﷺ asked him about his story, tell us your story. Now it was everybody was curious about the story of this man, such a strange behavior. Why did he start kissing the Prophet ﷺ, kissing his back and weeping and crying? He started telling his story. Now this man was one of the great, he became actually one of the great companions of the Prophet ﷺ. Who was he? Now I will not mention his name today. I will wait for your emails. You can write to us and expect what kind of who who he was. Inshallah, next time, because he will tell the companions, he will tell the Prophet ﷺ and will tell the companions his story. Such a wonderful and such a beautiful story. And it has so many lessons that we have to take today. Lessons that we have to learn and implement in our lives. So this is why I will leave his story for next time. But let's move on to see what happened to... As'ad ibn Zurara, who was just buried now, what happened to his family? The Prophet ﷺ went to his house and he said, you will be my family, I will take care of you. Everything you need, I will provide for you. And As'ad ibn Zurara had two little daughters. So the 
Prophet ﷺ came to the house of Asal ibn Zurara with two gifts to those daughters. With earrings made of gold, golden earrings with some pearl on them. The Prophet ﷺ gave it to them as a gift. Because those, they, they've just lost their father and their mother, she has just lost her husband who meant everything for her. The Prophet ﷺ came to her and she, he said to her, everything you need, I will secure it for you. I will provide you with that. I will be responsible for you from now on. So anything you need, you come to me. And this shows and reveals such a wonderful aspect of the life of, of the person of Muhammad ﷺ, that he considered himself to be the father, to be the guardian of all Muslims. He was ready to provide for every one of them, to take care of each one of them. And such a sensitive and sensitive aspect of his character when he recognized that those two little girls, they've just lost their father. So the messenger, the messenger وسلم, although he himself was a poor person, he came with two gifts to those, to those two little daughters, those two little girls. He came to them, showing them fatherly affection, fatherly love. He brought them those two golden earrings as a gift. And actually, those two little girls grew up to be among the great Muslims, the great companions, even one, the daughter of one of them. The daughter of one of those two girls. Later on, at a later stage of the history of Islam, she, she says, when I was a little girl, I saw my mother, I saw the earring that my mother had, which had been given to her by the Prophet ﷺ as a gift when her father had died. Such a wonderful person. The Prophet ﷺ leading the Muslims at that time after having fled from Mecca and you know, dealing with all the burden of being the leader of a community, of a Muslim community. And at that time, the Muslims were under threat from all the Arabs around, especially from the people of Mecca, most, you know, more increasingly from the disbelievers in Medina and the Jews who were living around Medina. Dealing with all those resp responsibilities, taking care of his own family, still the Prophet ﷺ did not miss showing affection and love to, to those two little girls after losing, losing their father. And this shows us what kind of person Muhammad ﷺ was, how wonderful he was, how great he was. That was Muhammad ﷺ, the human being, the leader of the Muslim nation, the leader of the Muslim state. Still he was su such an affectionate father and he paid attention to even little details, such as uh, in such uh, situations, in such critical moment for those little girls and their mother. So hopefully that we can develop such kind of a character, not forgetting about the little and tiny details. You know, many people, you know, a problem that the Muslim family has today, uh, those tiny details play such a, a major role in... Uh, supporting the family and maintaining the family. The father showing love and affection to his sons and his daughters, to his children. Sometimes a small gift that you give to your child makes a big difference in their lives forever. Small things that you can do with your wife or a wife with her husband. Showing them love and affection. Show your wife how much you care for her. Show your husband how much you care for him. Show your children how much you love them, that you care about them, and they mean a lot to you. And this will make wonders to your family life. The Prophet ﷺ was always aware of that. Not only for his family, but even to the, every member in his community. To every Muslim individual. He used to visit every one of them. He used to spend some time with them. He used to go and answer the invitations and eat food in their houses. He used to, even sometimes he was invited by old women. And he would go to their houses and join them and sit with them with all humbleness and show them love and affection. The atmosphere in Medina was such a beautiful atmosphere that everyone would love to have the opportunity, opportunity to, love in, to live in a similar situation or in a similar atmosphere. Now inshallah next time 
we'll talk more about the brotherhood. We will talk more about the Muslim life in Medina and how wonderful it ha life has become in Medina or how, how, and how wonderful Islam has made their lives. There, there are beautiful aspects that we will explore insha'Allah. So you are invited to join us next time. And don't forget to write to us. Until we meet next time, I leave you in the care of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah knows what's best for us. So why should we complain? We always want the sunshine. But he knows there must be rain We always want the laughter And the merriment of cheer But our hearts will lose their tenderness If we never shed a tear So whenever we feel that Everything's going wrong it is just Allah's way to make our spirits strong And the merriment of cheer But our hearts will lose their tenderness If we never shed a tear So whenever we feel that Everything's going wrong It is just Allah's way To make our spirits strong